Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is Session 5, Part 4 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue discussing God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, delivering more information about compensation itself, and examining some of the emotions and feelings we may have about sin and personal truth. This session was recorded on the 17th of October 2017 from 2 p.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Example of how the desire to love is rewarded by compensation. Hmm. So could you just give us one specific example of how the desire to love is rewarded. Sure, I thought I thought we'd choose an example relating to a married couple mm -hmm. who um, who I know mm -hmm. that one of the you know partner, let's say it's the husband, has uh, been sexually unfaithful to the wife. Yep, and I know about it. He might have said to me that he had been, or I might have seen him do it, or I might mm -hmm. have worked it out through events or whatever. And I know that he's been sexually unfaithful to his wife. What to do? What do I do? <laughs> what would your desire to love cause you to do? Yes, well, let's look at what the world would usually do. Mm -hmm. What the world would normally do is I'd firstly work out whether there is anything that's going to benefit me by saying anything. Mm -hmm. And then if they was, they would say something. Yeah. And if there wasn't, they would say nothing. And if there's something <laughs> potentially negative that could happen, then they definitely wouldn't. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we're usually unethical when mm -hmm. it comes to these kind of matters. And um, most of the time I'm quite selfishly motivated in, in the analysis of these kind of matters too, because I'm only interested in like, do I like the wife and maybe I'd like to have a relationship with her? So what I'll do is I'll tell her mm -hmm. that her husband cheated on her. Mm -hmm. Or do I not like the man and I'd really like to see him, I really want to cause him trouble in his life. Oh, well, then I'll tell the wife that, yeah. you know, yeah. he's been unfaithful to her. But, but it's rare to find a person who's motivated by just love and concern for both of them. Love and concern for the person who cheated to mm -hmm. try to work through his emotional issues as to why he's done it. Mm -hmm. And love and concern for the person who has ha had, you know, is, is unaware. Is in the dark about it. Of the behavior, mm -hmm. So that her uh, free will can be enabled to decide what she's going to do about it. Mm -hmm. And and also that you know something uh, that she probably should know. And if her husband was brave enough and, and honest enough and truthful enough and ethical enough, he'd probably already have told her. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. But, but it's rare for a person to consider those kind of factors. Mm -hmm. And most of the time we're very motivated selfishly. In other words, we're just interested in the pleasure or trouble that it may cause us by being involved in the situation. Yeah, mm. yeah. But let's look at what the right thing to do is. Now, if I was motivated by love, I would desire that firstly my friend mm -hmm. tells his partner mm -hmm. that he has cheated on her. Mm -hmm. And if he decides that he is not going to do it, yep. I would still desire that she knows. Mm -hmm. And that's because a part <clears throat> of the loving desire is the understanding that truth, exposing truth for both parties is going to lead to the most benefit in the long term. That's right. Yep. It will lead to the most benefit in the long term. Mm -hmm. Now. You know, obviously, under those circumstances, if I was motivated totally by love, truthfulness and ethics, mm -hmm. um, and I decided to do that, potentially because of the way the world sees kind of these kind of things, I probably might get to be, you know, have a lot of negative things happen to me from these, from mm -hmm. one or both of these people. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, the, man, the person who did the deed, in this case, the man, um, he he would be angry with me. He'd resent me. He'd not i would not be his friend anymore, and so forth and so forth. And he might even try to make my life very difficult as a result of me being ethical. Mm -hmm. And even ironically, the wife may do the same thing because she may not want to even know that he is. You know, yeah. she'd rather remain ignorant. Yeah. Um, she'd rather not have to process through anything emotionally. She'd rather maintain the illusion that their relationship is okay than actually face the truth that it's not mm -hmm. and things like that. And so she might also decide to attack me and, you know, and, and eventually do a lot of damaging things to me as a result of me being truthful. Mm -hmm. 
But if I am motivated by love and my desire is motivated only by love to help them yeah. both, then none of those negative consequences that happen will ever be attributed to me anyway. Uh -huh. They will always be attributed to the persons involved. Yeah. Now, so if you were truly concerned, yeah. um, you wouldn't, you, there would be no judgment of the behavior mm -hmm. because we know from our own experience that any person who has a certain set of emotional conditions may be tempted to, com to be sexually immoral. Yeah. Uh, and unless we remove those emotional conditions from ourselves, uh, there's a high likelihood we will become sexually immoral. So, so, but but we would want still want the people to know and understand so that they've got the best opportunity possible to and the and the fastest opportunity possible mm -hmm. to attempt to correct the situation. Yeah. 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 Now, if I was ethical like that. Yeah there are immense rewards for me personally. Mm -hmm. Now, the rewards may not and probably will not come from the people involved, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they certainly come through the operation of God's laws. Yeah. So the fact that I have stood up for what is right mm -hmm. and been loving to both of those parties in an attempt to help them heal their relationship. So in the, go ahead. It, God's laws reward me for that behaviour uh -huh. of attempting to do the loving thing by informing both parties of what we believe is the loving thing for them to do. So these would be your actions, because we haven't really talked through that. Your actions firstly would be to say to the unfaithful party, I believe that your, par your partner needs to know about your behaviour. Um, and then what would you do? Well, I'd give them a certain period of time, perhaps a short yeah. period of time to, um, you know, state the truth about yeah. their behaviour to their yeah. to their party partner. And then I would go to the partner and say, has yeah. your husband told you that he's been sexually unfaithful? Yeah. Yeah. Quite bluntly like yeah. that probably. Yeah. Um, because I... I know about it and I, I talked to him about it a week ago mm -hmm. or two weeks ago and, and he told me that he had and I'm just checking to make sure he has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that behaviour would be um, rewarded in and of itself. The decisions that the people make as a result of that, of you taking those actions, are totally their responsibility. But if they were positive, mm -hmm. they will also be attributed to you, to me. Yep for beginning the procedure, if you like. For creating for the creating potential. For creating the potential for yep. those particular events to occur. Yeah. However, if they take uh, unloving actions, actions. towards yep. each other or myself, yep. none of those actions are attributed to me. Yeah. So in other words, if the wife got really, really upset and decided to buy a gun and shoot her husband, mm -hmm. um, you know, that would be completely up to her. And that's because your intention in exposing the truth was loving for both parties. Yeah. I didn't want her to shoot her husband and just like I didn't want him to be unfaithful to his wife. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, and I didn't encourage him to be unfaithful to his wife and, I'm, and, I'm, and I didn't encourage her to shoot her husband. Mm -hmm. um, so I am blameless for whatever actions they then take. That's you. Mm. Okay. All right. So that desire to love is rewarded by the law. Yes, and the rewards are quite intense, actually, because it, firstly, there's a whole lot of personal rewards for your soul immediately, which include, which include knowing that you've done the right thing, mm -hmm. your conscience not bothering you, mm -hmm. no matter what the outcome. Yeah. So my conscience wouldn't even bother me if the wife shot the husband. Mm -hmm. and my conscience would not bother me, um, no matter what the outcome. You, you realise if you've done the right thing for the right motive, there would be no personal negative consequence as a result. Yeah. And you would also, um, any, any like behaviour within your, any feelings within yourself that arise as a result of the, outcoming, the outcomes um, were feelings inside of you anyway that did yeah. need to be addressed and, and yeah. need to be released. Yeah. yeah, and that will help you get closer to God and closer to your own partner and, and mm -hmm. to yourself. 
But not only that, the long-term benefits are, are quite significant, including the benefit after you pass. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Both of those parties will eventually work through their issues of forgiveness and repentance for their actions mm -hmm. and, uh, and probably at some point in the future come to thank you for <laughs> your, your involvement, your courageous, your courageous involvement. Yeah. Now that point in the future might be hundreds of years hence, yes. you know, it might be hundreds of years in the future. Yeah. But uh, but that's what I've found personally. I've done this many times. Yes. Um, and you, you've been with me when I've done it at some times. Yes. And so, you know, I've always found there to be uh, a lot, the long term benefits far outweigh the short term, mm -hmm. the short term problems associated with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Example of how the desire to sin is compensated. It's penalised by compensation. Mm. So can we give an example now of how a desire to sin is penalised by compensation? And I've, if we use the same scenario that we yes. did in the previous question. So the scenario again is the, where we have a, a couple who is a friend of ours who, mm -hmm. who are partners with each other, sexual partners with each other, whether they're married or, or just partners, it's immaterial. And, uh, and, and one of the parties, in this case, we've chosen the example of the husband has mm -hmm. cheated on the wife. And, and so she, he's sexually been unfaithful to his wife. And uh, we now have the option of telling the truth mm -hmm. about the situation. Firstly, to the husband, that mm -hmm. we know that he's done such a thing and that we'd encourage him to talk to his wife about it. And secondly, to the wife, we'd follow up with the wife to make sure that he has done that at some point in time so that both of them have the maximum ability to be able to bring their uh, relationship back into harmony with love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's our option. That's our, that's our scenario. <laughs> that's our scenario. But, but we decide. What's our, let's talk about now our intentions. Yes. So what are... Well, let's talk about a number of different intentions. Yeah. I might have now the intention to develop within me that I really think the wife's are pretty pretty hot right mm -hmm. and i'm single and and she's not single and i've been hanging around them for ages and i just really like her a lot and i'd really like to see them break up so that i could be with her yeah so let's say that's my intention yeah so i go and tell the truth mm -hmm. to her you know or him oh, or... no you wouldn't bother with him probably under right. those circumstances okay. you'd probably say it to her yeah you look you know your husband's cheated on you mm -hmm. You wouldn't be too probably under those circumstances concerned for love for the husband, would you? So you probably wouldn't go and tell him to do it first. Mm -hmm. uh, and you wouldn't certainly have the motivation that it's a loving outcome because your motivation is that they have a breakup. And yes. that's your intention. You want them yes. to break up. So, so now your intention is quite obviously flawed. Mm -hmm. It's quite obviously out of harmony with love. Now, let's say in that process, she shoots him. Mm. You are partially responsible for the murder, in fact, now, mm -hmm. from God's perspective. And you will, it'll be like you shared in the creation of the murder. Mm -hmm. And that's because your intention was to create disharmony between them. Yes. It was an exposure of truth with the intention to create damage. Yes. You might not have foreseen the damage that she might murder him, mm -hmm. but... Um, but your underlying feeling was that you still, it's better that he's not in her life. Yes. And you did try to create an event where he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And now there's an extreme one yep. created. Now, while you might not have predicted it, you are partially responsible for it because of your motivations. Mm -hmm. Let's say, though, that she didn't do that, but she just decided to leave him. Right. And you would probably rejoice mm -hmm. in that in that outcome. Yeah. And uh, hence displaying your true feelings about the matter. Yeah. That you didn't really love both parties at all and you had a personal, a personal selfish motivation. Mm -hmm. That is also going to be penalised by God's laws. Yeah. The fact that you have been personally selfish mm -hmm. in regards to your motivation. Mm hmm. And that will soon demonstrate itself probably in the new relationship. Yeah. yeah. Your personal selfishness will be demonstrated in your new relationship. Yeah. And it will certainly be demonstrated within yourself. Mm -hmm. Like one way, sooner or later, she is going to ask you, what was your motivation for telling her the truth? Mm -hmm. 
and so sooner or later she's going to know the motivation. Yeah. But also he now, you know, has is now separate from her. And once he finds out your motivation, now that the two of you are together, mm -hmm. he may respond very angrily to the motivation, even to the point of wanting to kill you. Mm. Mm. And while you are not to blame for his desire to kill you, mm -hmm. you are certainly contributed to his desire to kill mm -hmm. you. And so you cannot say you're innocent of your own murder yes. <laughs> under those circumstances. Yes. You have partial compensation. It's actually part of your compensation. Yes, yeah. it's part of your compensation that you created it. Mm -hmm. so, so there are quite a lot of potential negative outcomes in this scenario. Yes. Um, and, and all of which are, have a soul-based cause which the compensatory laws are trying to correct. Mm. Right? Mm. Now, let's say, though, that you, you, you just had an intention that you just didn't want to see them happy. In other words, you were jealous of them or and so you told the truth under those circumstances. Or you were angry with men. Or you're angry with men generally. Like that could be. And you just wanted to break them up, you yep. know, get her out of his clutches is the or idea. Punish or, him or, or, or punish him or whatever. These are all similar types of motivations mm -hmm. to the first example I gave. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, there's very strong negative consequences for that kind of selfish behaviour as yes. well. And that's just you not wanting to face your own emotions yeah. and then using those emotions as an excuse to make other li persons' lives miserable. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's assuming you want to tell the truth about the matter. Yeah. So you can actually want to tell the truth about the matter and actually be driven by unhealthy and unloving emotions and therefore have negative consequences even yes. though you told the truth yes right? the second part of this scenario or the third one now we're really looking at is where i wanted to lie about the matter okay. in other words i want to cover over that it happened i don't want to say anything usually these are all about self-preservation mm -hmm. all of these selfishness and self-preservation mm -hmm. It's about, you know, and we use the excuses of like, I don't want to meddle with their life. Or it's none of my business. Or it's none of my business. Or, you know, and the truth is, if you truly loved your friends, um, any aspect of love is your business, like yeah. it is. If you truly love them, you don't go in in a self-righteous way because you're also aware that you yourself under the same circumstances, if you had similar emotional injuries, might do exactly the same thing. So, so it's not a judgment of them mm -hmm. or a judgment of him in the case of the example we're giving, but rather it's just like, no, I know this is a problem. It's not going to be good for their marriage. I'm concerned about it. And so I want to let them know. But, but if you don't want to let them know, or you're afraid of letting them know, now you're more concerned about how you are going to be treated yes. than you are about them at all. Mm -hmm. You are now being completely selfish. Yeah. Right? And this complete selfishness is immediately penalised by a further compensation against yourself. You had the option to tell the truth mm -hmm. and you've decided against it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that option to tell the truth, but the decision to not tell the truth is going to now cause the law to correct your lack of courage and your general lack of faithfulness and, and your consideration of fear. Yes. Whatever You're those fears might fear. be, you're yep. honouring a fear. And the law is going to attempt to correct all of that behavior. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things now that are going to happen in your life where you put in tricky situations with the couple where, you know, they're acting a certain way towards each other and you know that's false and your conscience is going to keep bothering you. You're going to have some sleepless nights about it as a result of that generally. You're going to really struggle uh, emotionally with it over time. You'll have to detune from that to cope with it. So mm -hmm. you'll deny, you, you'll try and detune and deny your emotions. That will cause your own degradation of your own emotional condition and connection with yourself. And eventually you're going to get into a state where, you know, you think it's OK that you did it. Yes. But you'll also be in a degraded emotional condition. Yeah. As well. Yeah. 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 So there's not very many good outcomes here. You know, <laughs> yeah. If I guess, motivated by the wrong motivation. I guess the other reason that people don't speak up about it is because they have the same condition within themselves where they feel already they don't even see a problem with it because they Correct. see... Where they that. see that, you know, it's okay to cheat on your wife. Yeah. And of those circumstances, um, you You're obviously already. have already been got, gotten into the condition where you think that this kind of behaviour is okay. And that would already be detrimental to your soul and to your relationships. Mm -hmm already uh, yeah. you already be there yeah. in that degraded yeah. condition yeah but whatever you've chosen to do on this negative side of things 
and we've seen that two of the possible choices are to to actually tell the truth but for the wrong reasons yeah and the other possible choices are to lie or withhold the truth for the wrong mm -hmm. reasons all of those actions are going to have to be compensated for at some point in your future yeah and many of them will be immediately compensated through th feelings of guilt shame your conscience bothering you when you're with the couple and this is why frequently when one party cheats on the other and a third party observes and sees mm -hmm. the third party frequently withdraws from the couple yes. in order to avoid yeah. their own uh, emotional triggers yeah. by the couple still engaging a relationship yeah yeah in other words they're willing to destroy the relationship with the person in order to not cope with their, you know, to order to avoid their own emotions. Yes. Yes. yes it's quite so they serious. didn't love the couple very much in the first place under those circumstances. No. Yeah. And crucially, again, you're saying that. It, so earlier you said even your own murder, you can be partly. It's partly. Partly responsible for. Part of your responsibility or your compensatory uh, penalty. Mm -hmm. um, so crucially you're saying that when i choose to act unlovingly then all negative decisions that flow on from that decision of mine mm -hmm. i'm partially or all compensated negative potentials. all negative potentials that exist mm -hmm. so even if nobody murders me the potential of it is partially attributed to me yes whereas if i act lovingly which we talked about in the previous example and i'm motivated by a sincere loving desire and that's what leads me to speak truthfully then um i'm given all the rewards and lots of benefits even if other people do even if i do get murdered as a result exactly none of that is attributed to me exactly exactly yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, there is a major difference, obviously, between doing the positive, the loving thing when it comes to compensation or, and doing the unloving thing. And what I like about this example is that you can do identical acts. You can un participate or undertake identical actions. Almost. Almost. Well, just driven by the different emotions. It, but it's driven by different emotions. Exactly. And I, the reason I said the thing about telling the husband first earlier is because what I notice is that a lot of people around us um, do, because they're in a facade with themselves and they want to maintain a facade with other people, they say, oh, no, I told the husband first. And they actually do do it. But their underlying motivation is often as damaging it's just that they want to maintain a facade to themselves and exactly. that's why i said you can do the identical thing and actually be in a vastly different condition uh, as a result of it condition yeah, yeah. If you the remember start, the law a, the compensatory laws measure intention and desire yes. they yeah. don't measure action yeah necessarily you know they measure measure the intention and desire behind the mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. yeah yeah. And so this is what we always must need to, you know, we always need to remember this yeah. if we're really going to understand the law of compensation. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and, you know, the reason why we're having this discussion about the, the actions, uh, of course, because we need to relate this in some way in the future to the discussion of repentance and forgiveness. Yeah. And compensation has a large effect, obviously, when it comes to penalising us for our unloving acts. It has a large effect on motivating us to a point of repentance mm -hmm. and uh, also motivating us to a point of forgiving others. Yeah. And so, you know, the beauty of the law, you can see why God created it. It's a great, great series set of laws. It's mm -hmm. a, like most of these higher laws are a set of laws all in our operation. And, and you can see from the example we've given just oh, the, the two examples we've given really, but the example we've given with regard to the pen penalties associated with uh, compensation, you can see that here the idea from God is to correct you. Yes. To correct you for your unloving attitudes and behaviour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feelings about sin and desiring personal truth. So, so far in our discussion, we've, we're have we starting to see that a lot of the compensatory uh, rewards and compensated compensatory penalties uh, do surround our feelings and emotions, even if we're not necessarily sensitive to them at the time. Mm -hmm. But once we start to open up emotionally a little bit to ourselves, we can start to feel some emotions uh, and sometimes we feel good and sometimes we feel bad and sometimes it can feel confusing. And so the next 
part of our session today, we're going to talk about some ways that we can have seemingly contradictory emotions about sin and about facing personal truth and um, sometimes why it seems to feel good and then a bit bad or bad and then a bit good or mm -hmm. and and where sometimes people throw their hands up in the air and say, I just can't trust my feelings because honestly, I think I'm doing the right thing, but it doesn't necessarily feel that good or whatever. Yeah. 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 So there, there, should we say there's a whole lot of confused emotional states that may arise <laughs> and there's a reason why they arise. And we probably need to discuss the potential reasons as to why these confused emotional conditions might arise with regard to compensation. Yeah. 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 Why I feel worse when I face personal truth. So this is my first one, is it like yes. feeling worse facing yes. personal truth? Facing personal truth. <laughs> now, some people who've known us for a while have probably experienced this, <laughs> where they hear something about themselves, they think, yeah, that's true, but now I feel shockingly bad. Mm, mm. Um, so our question here is, why does that happen? Why do I feel worse when I face personal truth? Aren't I actually doing something m more loving by facing truth? Shouldn't there be less compensation or, or some kind of reward for facing truth? Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't feel so bad, should I? So, so why do I feel worse when I face personal truth sometimes? Well, the reality is there are many, many reasons why a person might feel worse. And uh, probably what we need to do is list a few you know more substantial reasons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but to be for people to be aware that even though we're going to discuss uh, you know three or four substantial reasons to why you might feel worse by facing personal truth it doesn't mean the list is exhaustive there, there, there might be a lot of reasons why this happens but what we need to do is give people a bit of a clue if you like mm -hmm. about what the possible reasons might be and that way uh, we can help help them sort of see see things a bit more uh, realistically and analytically when it comes to this issue of feeling worse when you have personal truth presented to you. Yes. You, we know from our experience that the majority of people, particularly when we go to groups and things like that, the majority of people who have some personal truth uh, presented to them usually react quite badly and quite angrily and oftentimes we never see them again actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and all this is, uh, you know, because they obviously felt bad in the moment yep. and then didn't want to repeat the experience and there must have been a reason why they felt bad in the moment yeah. and and we probably need to explain the potential reasons and some of them at least so that they can come to understand what's really going on yes all right so we'll talk about in four main areas mm -hmm. where that could potentially lead us to feel worse and i'll actually go into it in detail with you i'll just list them now yeah so the first is um, I can feel worse due to a new sensitivity to the actual compensation I've been living with and the actual sin that I'm in. Yeah, so this is basically saying that there's a new, you've raised out of some emotional denial. Yes. And you've got to be, you know, you're now aware of some things that were aware within you before, but you were denying. You were denying before. Just, oh, so that's the first one. Looking yep. At, yep. Um, I can feel worse due to an attachment to my facade. So in other words, I, I really like the person I think I am. I think I'm an And eight. you just told me yeah. that I'm a different person than I think yeah, I am. Yeah. I don't like you for yeah. that. Yes. <laughs> that feels pretty bad. That feels pretty bad. Um, I can feel worse because my addictions are no longer being met. Yeah, so, you know, I've got the addictions which go, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, you know, whatever it is that I'm looking for. Yeah. It might be physical or emotional, mostly. Validation. Sexual, You're a man, give me validation. Yeah, give me whatever you want, want from the person, and the person's not doing it anymore. No, they're saying, actually, uh, I'm not feeling that turned on by you right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't I go don't. for what you're doing, yeah, and, yeah. and that and makes that us feel, feel like, oh, well, how dare you? bad. You don't love me anymore. You're yes. not meeting my demands and addictions. Yes, yeah. and I feel very worse. <laughs> um, and I can feel worse due to the desire to sin still remaining within me. Yes, this in other words, I, I see that, yes, I do do that. Yeah. Wow, yeah, I do. And you, yeah. What you said is true. Yeah, yeah I, I see that. And then all of a sudden I have this feeling come over me. Wow, but I just want to keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, like, well, even if I don't have the feeling that yeah. I want to keep doing it, I might even self-punish about it. But the truth is the fact that I still want to keep doing it means well, it, that I'm incurring compensation. But my, my view of self-punishment, I know it's a bit of a digression, is, is that you do it because you want to avoid 
the actual stopping the actual thing. That's what I mean. That's why you're self-punished. That's what so, I mean. So at the end of the day, it's still that you want to do it. Yes. And and so you, you want to get the results, you, you, and you feel within yourself you want to. And and now every time you meet that person, you're reminded, <laughs> aren't you? It's like yeah. Ah, they told me about that thing, and they're telling me again, and they're telling yeah. me again. And sometimes it happens like that, and and they're telling me the same thing again. And ah, oh, you know, I just want to. No, my better course of action is to not see that person anymore. Yeah. And then I'll be able to live in this sin mm. without thinking it bad. You'll go back to <laughs> denial. <laughs> so let's talk about these in more detail, Hank. Yes, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, okay. So the first one, feeling worse due to new sensitivity to compensation and sin. Mm -hmm. When I face personal truth, why is it that I often feel worse due to this new sensitivity to compensation and sin? Well, once you, once you feel the truth, or once somebody exposes the truth to mm. you, there are a number of new things going on inside of you now that weren't going on before. Before, you could ignore it. Mm -hmm. you, you could... You could ignore the truth about a lot of things about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, as people say, there's a common saying, isn't there, that ignorance is bliss. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's thought to be bliss, it's not actually bliss from God's perspective. And, and in fact, it, ignorance is, is bliss is a very negative, actually, way of believing, a ne negative belief from God's perspective. Yeah. But the reason why we think it's bliss is because if we're not aware of something, we can then ignore it. And, and we can ignore it easily. Mm -hmm. But when a person tells us the truth, now there's a whole series of things that we can't easily ignore. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Yes. So, so the first one is... So the first thing is, I can't ignore now that the like, compensation for that sin exists. Mm -hmm. I can't ignore it anymore. Yep. yep. So I can't ignore that... There's this negative feeling that I have that's probably associated with that being true about me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and that uh, the it's harder to den to to ignore it now. Yes. Like because I'm now sensitive. Like the truth has opened up a sensitive pathway in me now. Yes. To this emotional sensitivity to to that being potentially true. Mm -hmm. Before I could just walk around going, no, I'm great. No, there's no problem with me. Everything's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, and not even think about it. Mm -hmm. But when somebody tells me it now, it's going to start bothering me. Yes. Yeah. At some level emotionally. Yes. If I continue to think about it, and if I see the person. Yes. Yes. Mm. And then corresponding with that, what often then happens is we start to get this niggling feeling, I'm going to have to change this about myself. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and that's not a great feeling if you still want to avoid the emotion yeah. that's associated with that truth. Yeah, it's yeah. like we're con you know, now constantly confronted with, yes, I can see this is the thing and it's a bit annoying now that I'm aware, you know, mm. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. the feeling we normally have. But also there's this feeling of, Oh, now that I know it's there, what am I going to do about it? Yeah. Yeah. And especially if we've become sensitive, as you said, like, I'm doing this thing, I want this thing, but it's causing, you know, it doesn't feel that good inside of me. I'm probably going to have to change it, but oh, no, I don't that's really want to change it. I've got to deal with something now else. Now that somebody's made me aware of it, I can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I can't. Yeah. And, and the way the conscience work is, is interesting here because when we talk later, we'll talk about the conscience and the conscience actually. Once the pathway is open for God to communicate truth to you about the matter, mm -hmm. God's going to keep knocking on that door yes. <laughs> through the conscience. And, yes. uh, and as a result of that, it feels like you can't stop thinking about it or you can't, you know, things keep reminding you of it. Yes, you know? yes, <laughs> so yes, so yes. This, this heightened emotional sensitivity to the yes. problem is now causing you some pain and suffering. And the guilt and the pain that are a natural part of the compensation is harder to ignore, I'm more aware of it. That's right, yes. yes. Yeah. So this is why in the short term, when I get told a personal truth and I become aware of it as a truth, I can start to feel worse. Yeah, it's a, it's a you know, this, this, and really we're saying it's a heightened emotional sensitivity mm. to our true condition. Yeah. So in other words, by somebody exposing the truth, or telling the truth, 
now I am a bit more awareness emotionally mm -hmm. and intellectually that there is a problem that exists mm -hmm. and that I may need to think about doing something about it. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> and crucially here, it's not that that pain and negative feeling didn't exist before. Correct. It was always there, but my denial uh, was able to dampen down this, this negative feelings. Yes, this I could, feeling and, I, and I could dampen it down by denying the truth of it. Yes. But when somebody tells me the truth of it, now it's harder to yeah. dampen the truth of it down yeah. without avoiding the person. Yeah. Right? yeah. So often when we tell the truth to somebody, we find that that's the last time we ever see them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> For that reason. Absolutely. Mm. But hopefully that new sensitivity well, the new sensitivity is going to continue yes. playing until yeah. they either decide to allow themselves to take action about that sensitivity mm -hmm. or to try to resuppress it again, yeah. which has its own negative consequences. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Feeling worse due to attachment to the facade. Mm -hmm. So again, here we're talking about when I face personal truth, why is it I often feel worse as a result of me being quite attached to my facade? Well, it, we've got to remember here that our facade is our personal image of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not just presented to others, it's presented to ourselves. Yes. So most of us have a huge addiction to continue presenting this image of ourselves to ourselves. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of, you could liken it to, you know, having a, having a plastic surgery facelift because you're not happy with your face. Yes you're now seeing the facade. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry anymore about what you really look like. Mm -hmm. You're now, you, you know, you now think you look like that new person, mm -hmm. you know, but underlying all it all is still the old person there. But, yeah. but you now want to believe and wish to believe that you are this new person. The reason why we hold on to a facade is because we are addicted to it yeah. for whatever reasons. Now, there's lots and lots of reasons. There's literally hundreds of possible reasons. Mm -hmm as to why we might be addicted to our facade. And we'll, we'll mention a few things that occur emotionally as a result of it, but, but rather than discussing all the hundreds of reasons, we need to see that most of us have this very, very strong addiction mm. to maintaining an image of ourselves that we ourselves can accept. Yeah. And when somebody else tells us truth, yes. that image of ourselves has now started to be dismantled. Mm. It's challenged in it's some challenged. way, and that feels not so great because we want, we are invested, as you said, yep. in, we believe it's more, we're more acceptable to ourselves, to others, if we are this well, version ourselves. of ourselves. It's to ourselves we're mostly interested in. That's what so I we think, are, yeah. We are more acceptable to ourselves if we maintain this illusion yep. that we, this is how we are, and this is yep. what we look like and so forth. So when someone tells us personal truth, I'm feeling more exposed now. Mm -hmm. I, I also might feel some shame about yes, my uh, sin. Like, uh oh, somebody's digging down underneath this facade and I don't want them to see what's there because yep. what's there I'm ashamed of and that's why I created my facade. So that's an unpleasant feeling. Um, I might even take now actions to fix this behavior, this, this thing that's been pointed out to me, but I do it in my facade. That's right. I so just, it's not a real process I'm undertaking. So really what I'm doing here is I'm going, more. okay, that plastic surgery didn't work too good last time. So what I'm going to do is have a patch type job and yeah, yeah. get this bit fixed a up, bit right? More <laughs> to get, to and, get it sorted out. And we do know a lot of people don't, we, where they've heard personal truth and then they just modify their behavior, change the, change the facade. Yeah, um, it's, it, a, it's a learned behaviour from childhood, actually. Because yeah. Because what we were taught frequently in childhood is that you don't have to clear away the cause of what you do. Yes. You just need to fix the effects of what you do. Yeah. And the facade, developing a new one, is a way of, or, or just modifying or t tweaking <laughs> the old one, is a way of getting out of having to actually change the underlying cause for that behaviour. Yeah. And so we're addicted to tweaks. Yes. And, and sometimes we, we actually create whole new facades when we're relating to different people, mm -hmm. in fact. So we have one set of facades with our partner, one another completely different set of facades for our workmates, another completely different set of facades with our parents, and so forth and so forth. And most people, as we've discussed in our assistance group, I think it was the second one, 
in 2016. And most people have, a, have usually anywhere from five to seven standard facades that yeah. they use in different situations. Yeah. And then they have tweaks that they yeah. make to those facades to perfect them over their lifetime. Yes. <laughs> And, but we're talking here about when we're so attached to those things, someone points out the truth, we can try and fix this situation how we see it mm. by generating another facade or fixing up a level of the facade. By making a tweak. But that actually <laughs> ends up making us feel worse because we're getting further and further removed from who we are. From well, it might not make us initially feel worse. Um, oftentimes we do it because we think we're avoiding feeling worse. Yes. Um, but in the long run, yes, it will, because it detunes you further from your true self. And the problem with detuning further from your true self is that eventually you will feel worse. Yes, yep. exactly. So that's going to be a exactly. long term result, even though you might have the, the tweak might give you a short term satisfaction. Mm -hmm. But to be frank, any person who's well enough developed emotionally will notice that all you're trying to do is make a tweak yes. <laughs> rather than actually cure the problem. Yeah. And, and those particular people will remind you of that as well. <laughs> so you can't even get away with your tweaks anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Hmm. So our attachment to our facade is all about resistance to breaking down the fiction that we have about ourselves to ourselves. Yes. And we're often uh, violently opposed to that. Mm -hmm. When I say violently, we will often resort to violence mm -hmm. in order to oppose yep. a person seemingly destroying the image that we have of ourselves. Mm. And because we view this as this <clears throat> facade as the most acceptable part of ourselves, then when that gets challenged by hearing personal truth, we often feel more afraid that other people will attack us because they're going to see something in us that they feel is not good because we view it as not good. And so then we can feel worse just because we're feeling more afraid. Yeah, that, that comes from a lot of personal shame as well. Like we, mm. we often have when our facade is exposed, the underlying condition starts to come through, which yeah. we're ashamed of. Yes. So often we wanted to maintain the illusion of our facade because it prevents us from feeling the emotion of shame. Yeah. And now the emotion of shame starts popping up every time we see that person mm. or every time that person shows us something, the yeah. emotion of shame starts popping up. And that's going to cause us to want to suppress that emotion if we don't have a desire to feel it. Mm. And uh, that, of course, is going to cause us to react negatively and feel worse, feel worse. about yeah. the truth being exposed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So there's lots more reasons why our attachment to our facade makes us feel worse when we hear personal truth. Yes. And you, you could discuss the matter for weeks on end, really. You could, the other yeah. Day. yeah. We're, what we're trying to do here is give our listeners a bit of a chance to see what might be the motivations inside of themselves for, for avoiding personal truth mm -hmm. and, and resisting it, which, which obviously has its own compensatory effects. Yes. But... but Normally, you would think, with, and this is the general theme we're trying to discuss, is that normally you would think that accepting personal truth makes you feel better. Because but can, of the compensation. Because of the compensation yep. rewards for accepting yes. personal truth. But actually, there are many things it exposes which may make you feel worse, which is the, the compensation for your past sins exactly. Exactly. that you're yet to be sensitive to. Yeah. In other words, there are things that happened in the, the compensation things that happened to your soul before when you mm -hmm. did the bad thing, mm -hmm. but now you, you become aware of it. Yeah. And, and oftentimes the becoming aware of it feels worse than it being there. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's so much about truth exposing this current situation. So often mm. personal truth exposes the pain we're already living in, but just in denial of. Yes. Yeah. And so well, this is always a good sign if a person does feel worse initially with these, <laughs> these matters, because it means that, and if they feel worse because of their facade, it means that at least now they're sensitive to the fact that the facade is operating. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, when they felt okay about their facade, they weren't even sensitive about it. So it is growth. Yes. But, but just, it, it can sometimes feel worse, that's yes. all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Feeling worse due to addictions no longer being met. So when I face a personal truth, why do I often feel worse as a result of my addictions not being met? Well, I, I think it probably would be quite clear if a person was educated about their addictions, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like the, the purpose of addiction is to avoid some underlying emotion 
or to get some emotion that you feel is devoid within yourself. So in other words, you're trying to avoid something that you don't want to feel, yeah. or you're trying to get something from someone else that you do want to feel yeah. and that you don't feel. So, so either way, the addiction is motivated by a selfish desire mm -hmm. to, to have other people either make your feelings go away mm -hmm. or to make you have good feelings or feelings you define as good. Yeah. And these addictions, whether they're physical, you know, like drugs, alcohol, eating, food, sex, whatever, or spir spiritual with regard to love, what we'd call our love addictions, you know, mm -hmm. you need me, I need you, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Or um, with regard to just gen general moral issues like ethics and morality, whatever the addictions are relating to, we are very focused on maintaining them mm -hmm. because they all prevent us from feeling things that God feels we need to feel and get rid of, yeah. but that we do not want to feel or, or experience. And we have the concept in our mind and our concept in our feelings that if we felt them, it would be the end of our world. Yeah. And so we don't want to feel them. Or we have a concept in our mind that if other people didn't give us what we wanted, it would be the end of our world mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to feel that. Mm -hmm. And so we're heavily emotionally invested in avoiding awareness of our addictions. Yes. So let's say someone sells and sells, tells us the truth about our addictions. Obviously, that's immediately going to feel uncomfortable because we think it's the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's the um, end of our world as we know it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the uh, just pleasant, the unpleasant feelings can often be fear. They can be um, a feeling like I'm never going to be happy again if I don't get my addiction met. Yeah, fear, um, a, a desire for happiness that you haven't got. Yeah, it can be. It can be even like worth, attention, approval, mm -hmm. acceptance. You, it could be sexual related, sexual acceptance, sexual approval, sexual desire. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of areas yep. that could be treated by by us having to become aware of our addictions. So you mean unpleasant emotions? Unpleasant in all emotions of those areas. associated with all those things. Yes. And and when I say unpleasant, they're in us. Yeah. They're, they're doing their damage to they're our body, new. to our health, everything. Yeah. But uh, they're not new, they're old, yeah. but uh, they are damaging us, mm -hmm. but we're just happy to be unaware of it. Yeah. And in fact, we even get diseases from many of these uh, addictions in play that we're desperate to, to maintain. Yeah. And in fact, things like there are the diseases that are quite substantial on the planet, like cancers and stuff that are all caused by, by these feeding of specific addictions. Mm -hmm. And, and yet we're, we're totally happy to go through terrible chemotherapy processes even rather than address the actual underlying addiction because we're so desperate for the underlying addiction. We are willing to die with our addictions, literally. Yeah. And in fact, many of our, you know, many deaths on this planet at the moment that are due to sickness and disease are deaths related specifically to the emotions associated with addictions. Yeah. So we're desperate for them. We're so desperate for them, we need to die to get them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So when someone comes along and exposes the truth of one, we go, what? <laughs> we <laughs> feel know? like it's life or death. Almost. Well, well, for yeah. many of us, we feel that way. Yeah. And hence, we have a huge violent reaction yeah. to the exposure of our addictions. Yes, and that violent reaction might be angry, it might be fearful, it might be desperate, it might be disillusioned. Suicidal. Um, suicidal. All sorts all of All of things. those things. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's just just exposing the just really fear that we're not wanting to feel about giving up that addiction. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes um, I've experienced where the underlying emotion that I've been avoiding through meeting the addiction starts to surface. Yeah. So it's not just the fact of giving up the addiction that feels unpleasant. It's like, oh no, I'm actually really afraid here. And that now, doesn't feel like Now it. the yeah. emotion that the addiction was covering yeah. also starts to poke its head out. Yes. And that's the emotion you're terrified of most yes. of the time. Yes. And so now you're like, whoa, this yes. is not feeling good now. I'm <laughs> no. feeling worse, right? Yeah. I'm feeling worse because not only are my addictions being exposed and I feel a bit ashamed about them and whatever else, yeah, yeah. but now the underlying thing that I'm covering with the addiction, which is the thing I want to avoid, the emotion I want to not experience, mm -hmm. I want to get rid of it mm -hmm. and suppress it and, and keep it away from me, that very thing I'm trying to keep away through the addiction is now also poking its head through. Yes. yes. Well, you know, so now I've got not only is my addiction get, not getting met, 
but also the underlying feeling is getting exposed. <laughs> Not pleasant. Not pleasant. <laughs> That's right. So that all causes unpleasant feelings. And then there's also the other thing where sometimes not a lot of that happens, but we, the truth of our addiction is pointed out to us. We become aware of it now. And now it's like the increased sensitivity that we talked about earlier where, mm -hmm. no, I'm still doing that. No, I'm still doing that. And years can go past and we're just feeling more and we're not, we're feeling worse about the truth being exposed to us. But it's only because we're continuing to act in the sin and we're now more sensitive to the compensatory effects of that. Yeah, the sin, you could say, is eating into our self-worth. Yeah. In other words, every time we sin, because we're now conscious of that, that sin, we're no longer in denial of it. It's been exposed to us. It now eats into our perception of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we know that every time I take the same action again, I feel disappointed with myself somehow. And, and this is sort of like a, a, an eating away of ourselves almost, it feels yes. like. So it's a very unpleasant feeling. Yes. You're far better off acting to remove the addiction <laughs> yeah. than uh, having that one. But yeah. unfortunately, the majority of people go down that track. Mm. Um, and, and in the end, you can't even hardly look at yourself in the mirror, yeah. you know, if you go down that track fully. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you still want your addiction met. Yes. Yeah. And, you, and you might have faced the personal truth of it, but you still want it. And it that you're going to feel worse then. Yeah, so, the, you know, you see this a lot with physical addictions where a person, you know, starts out with an addiction to drugs. They look in the mirror and they feel a bit disappointed with themselves and how they're getting haggard and whatever. And then over years, that drugs leads to some kind of immoral behaviour where they maybe even, you know, go into prostitution or other things like that in order mm -hmm. to get enough money or stealing to get enough money to get the drugs. Mm -hmm. And every time they look in the mirror, they feel worse about themselves. And that's a natural result of the compensatory effects of their behavior. Yeah. But they'd rather feel worse than themselves than they would face their addiction. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that obviously is going to feel much worse now. Yeah. 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 We're feeling worse due to the desire to sin remaining within me. So we're talking about when I've faced a personal truth when personal truth pointed out to me i recognize it mm -hmm. but i still actually want to continue in the sin mm -hmm. that's been pointed out to me why do i feel worse well before i look at that why we feel worse let's look at the dynamics here yeah here we've got this the sin has been pointed out the truth of it has been pointed out to me to some extent you know obviously at least intellectually i can see the truth of it you know i can see yeah it's probably not the right thing to do right mm -hmm. um but, but there's a whole heap of, what, what causes me to sin? Well, there's a whole heap of emotions, desires and passions, and there's motivation within me emotionally mm -hmm. to, to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's one thing for me to go, oh, yeah, I do do that. It's quite another thing to go, I don't want to do that anymore from a feeling perspective. Yes. Right? That's right. Now, most of the time when we come to admit that we do do something, we have yet to go through the mm -hmm. emotional thing of removing why we do it. Yes. So the why still remains. Yes. Now that it still remains, it is going to keep rearing itself up, motivating us to do it again. Yeah. Do it again. Yeah. Sin again. Sin yeah. again. And this desire to sin, now that it's exposed, is going to be bothering us all the time. Mm -hmm. And... I desire to sin, but I haven't yet rid of, got rid of that desire to sin. Yeah. And so naturally that's going to feel pretty uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm aware, at least intellectually, that it's wrong. And so, you know, I'm aware, at least intellectually, that it's probably not the good thing to do and that there'll be penalties associated with it and so forth. But on, but on side of that, I haven't let go of the reason why I want to do it. Yeah. And that's going to keep pestering me mm. like a nagging child you know <laughs> pestering mummy and daddy for a lolly yeah and um, it's going to pester 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 me you know it's like a, a drug induced addiction you know yeah. where it just pesters and pesters me they can't and in the end you can't think about anything else mm -hmm. than go ahead and do it again yes yeah. and then you feel even worse because you did it again and, and you already know, you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, it, that it's bad and you shouldn't be doing it, but I want to do it, but yeah. it's bad. Yeah. And you get into this real, um, I suppose you could say it's an emotionally confused state where, mm -hmm. where 
a part of you feels like you want to give it up and yeah. the other part of you feels like I want to fight for it I want to yeah. keep it yeah <laughs> <laughs> very unpleasant it sort of feels like you're tearing yourself apart sometimes yes. in that yeah. state it's a very real well I relate to it so much and it's a very real part of progression is it not I mean well it doesn't have to be necessarily because it, because it, if we get to the stage, well, obviously the in, between the intellectual awareness yes. and the emotional release, there is a stage, yes. obviously. Yep. But you can go from intellectual awareness to desire to deal with the causes emotionally very rapidly, rapidly. emotionally. You can do that. Yes. Most people don't. No. Because the desire to sin is firmly established yep. and, the re, and the seeming rewards yes. for it are firmly desired. Yeah. And you have to give up the desire for those rewards uh, or seeming rewards. You have to start to even see them as not even as rewards anymore. Yes. And you have to see, and actually, they're not even rewards. They're, they're actually causing more damage to me in my life. Mm. And you've, your belief systems have to change in this phase. And, and it's a very tricky period of time, actually, because, because you can change your belief systems quite rapidly if you're willing to feel emotion. But if you're not willing to feel emotion, it can be a very slow process. Yeah. So any person who is not willing to feel emotion is going to find this stage very unpalatable, mm -hmm. very difficult. Well, and long. And long, yeah. yes. Because it, it's the willingness to feel emotion that releases the underlying desire to sin. Yeah. And unless you're willing to experience the emotions that cause the desire to sin, you are going to want to continue sinning, even though you know <laughs> that it's probably not the thing to do. And isn't this really, though, one of the major purposes of compensation is to get us to that? It's almost like it sort of breaks down the resistance to that emotional state. It's the connection between our intellectual awareness. We can do that without feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but compensation is helping us to become sensitive to our soul based experience, isn't it? And yes. I, it, that's how it works for us, isn't it? That's, that's how right. I see it. It's like, oh, there's the pain of doing that. Oh, there's the pain of doing that again. But also the desire to do it again. Yes, and you and, feel the play between the two. And this is where this is where it's very dangerous to end self-punishment. You've got to yes. instead go into this mode of, okay, I did it again. I'm not too happy about the fact that I did it again. I need to, it's urgent for me, mm -hmm. it's, it's an imperative for me mm -hmm. to release the emotion of why I did it again. Yeah. And that's where I see most people fall down. They, they don't see the imperative of actually releasing the emotional reason for the cause of sin. Mm. But that's where self-punishment has its own compensator because basically you engage in self-punishment because you're afraid to, to do that or you... There's a lot of reasons I shouldn't make my Yeah, there's hundreds statements. of reasons, again, for self-punishment. Yep. Many of them are to avoid the pain of the That's actual what I mean. original emotion. That's what I mean. So, yeah. It's the, the whole purpose for engaging it is to avoid the fear of experiencing the actual emotion that is driving the sin. Exactly. And um, But what you find is it has its self-punishment has its own compensatory um, penalties that, that get really extreme if you engage that really a lot. So eventually you do end up, it can take a long time, but you do end up realising the pain I'm in and the fear I have of that other emotion, mm, I, it's, it's negotiable now, which one's bigger. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So eventually compensation leads us to... Leads you to, back to that original that, emotion that you're avoiding. It does, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, that's the way, workings of the law. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's a grand law in that regard. It is, mm. I feel like it's... it's um, doing so much for us yeah. anyway. So, so, so there's many reasons why, you know, feeling worth to do this, the desire for sin remaining within me. You know, once I see the desire for sin within me, I often feel ashamed about the desire yeah. for sin within me. There's, I often feel like um, I'm still ashamed that other people can see it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still reaping the compensation, as you said, because it, it's one thing to face truth, but the other thing to remove the desire. Yeah. And it's only when I remove the desire, even if I stop engaging the sin with the desire still in me, I'm just still going to be feeling more compensation pain, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's other reasons too. It's like um, I often feel more self-conscious mm. and conscious of what other people think of me Yeah. because I, I'm aware of my shame now. I'm aware of the things I'm ashamed of doing and the, and the sin I engage all the time. And I become... 
sometimes instead of just still trying to be my normal self, mm -hmm. I try to modify myself yeah. in order to not feel that shame. And that's not a good path to go down either because that's just generating facade. Yeah. And we've talked about that in the previous point we made. Yeah. So, so what we need to do is we need to go, okay, you know, I do have this sin and sure, this is going to be a bit of a tricky phase now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Removing this desire that I have to sin is going to be a bit tricky. Yeah. And uh, the key is to persist with it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right. So there's a lot of reasons of why that desire to sin, but you've touched on a lot of them there. And yeah, perhaps one more I'd like to mention is the desire, uh, the desire to avoid punishment from others. See, a lot of times we we feel that if somebody sees us sinning mm. and they know that we're sinning, mm. that they'll now punish us with that sin. Yeah. And this is a frequent problem. Uh, where mm. people do, and people do do that, unfortunately. Yeah. People in the world, when they notice that you notice something about yourself yeah. and that you're not too happy about it, a lot of other people start punishing you for it as well to make you feel bad. Yes. And that's a, that's a terrible process. You're far better off releasing the core emotion because yeah. then you won't feel bad about it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And then when somebody says, oh, you did that, they go, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't yeah. feel bad about having done that anymore. Yeah. You, you don't have that emotional signature left mm. in you anymore. And that's a part of the forgiveness and, uh, and repentance process. Mm -hmm. Once you go through the repentance process, you no longer have the emotional signature yes. of what you've done anymore. And so people can point it out to you mm -hmm. and you'll no longer go into your corner and cower and feel afraid of, or try to prevent them from exposing it anymore. Yeah. And so you're less manipulated then. But in between that time, it's quite tricky. You feel right. quite bad about that. Yeah. So there's a lot of reasons why this exposure of personal truth can initially feel bad, even though we are progressing from God's perspective. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And we've got to keep remembering that. Yeah. If we can see something now that we couldn't see before, that's progress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Mm. <laughs> All right.